I'm going to introduce just what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to look at the, the current climate of, of technology uh, generally, looking at technology that we currently use within Redford Court, looking uh, briefly about the OT role within technology and also the speech and language role, and then just briefly talking about the benefits of using technology and some of those the barriers as well. We have a 29 bed behavioural unit and we have occupational therapists, we have psychologists, we have physiotherapists and we have speech and language therapists. So in terms of the, the current climate of technology, um, you know, Brian touched on it earlier that it is an ever increasing part of our everyday lives and it's something that we use from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed. It's not just you know, tech people, it's not just young people, it's older people as well that are using more technology. Um, and I think I, I read one statistic recently, it was I think 2015-16, the, the over 75s using tablets and, and using mobile devices has doubled in that time and that's only going to increase and I think that's something we need to be aware of if we're going to be providing technology for our service users that it's not just certain groups that, that want to use it and are able to use it. So technology is seen as an essential part of service delivery um, and you know NHS trusts and local authorities are using it to try and increase the, um, um, the speed of, of discharges of supporting people at home, trying to get people back into the community. So we're just looking at some of the technology that we use at Redford Court. Um, we use mobile devices like tablets, like um, mobile phones uh, to, to help with prompting people um, through taking maybe pictures to help with memory recall. Amazon Echo, which we can use to, again, to, to prompt people in, in procedural learning and to help them with their orientation about the time and place and where they are. Fitbit watches, you know, you probably, you all know what they do in terms of like tracking and, and trying to motivate people to, to do more exercise, but they also are able to measure sleep and to, um, to also prompting as well. You can link your mobile phone into the Fitbit style watch or the iWatch to try and um, assist people with, with prompting. The uh, voice recording device, which is called the Memex, that's a, a wearable device that you can record specific messages. Uh, to, to help people's uh, memory if they you know, really struggle with, with remembering to do certain activities. And then you get your more high-tech sort of devices like your environmental controls and your AAC devices, which you, you briefly heard about earlier. Just to briefly talk about the OT role, I mean, I, I, as a, an OT myself, I'm not sure how many of you out there are OTs, but we are looking at the doing of activity, so you know, maximising what people can do and being able to enable people to do activities they maybe struggle with. In order for us to try and try and you know support technology within within with our service users, we need to first of all have an awareness of technology. So whether it is just reading about what's out there or visiting the Connectability Hub, for example, to, to know what is available. We're really good at assessing. So as OTs, we're really good at activity analysis, being able to really um, break down particular activities to what the person's strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and what, what maybe we can help improve. And then by doing that assessment, we're then able to match the needs of, of the technology that's available to their specific needs. And I think that's a really key role of OT is to be able to do that. Very often we, we, you know, we work with people for a certain amount of time and that's great. We can show them how, how the technology works. But what then happens when the person moves on? What happens when they maybe move into the community? Who's going to support them with that? And we need to be aware that do we train the carers? Do we train um, the family? or to be trained, you know, the service users themselves to enable them to, to have that awareness of, of how to use the technology, what if things go wrong. I've just put up there uh, some of the sort of key aspects of, of their role um, and they really focus on the specific sort of communication type devices. Um, so they share some of our role in terms of like assessing and training and support um, and establishing, you know, the goals, but they are looking at identifying specific technologies that are available for that person to, to meet their communications need, communication needs. So I've just put up there just some of the benefits of using technology. There's so many for me about increasing independence, about reducing intrusion and about transferring to community. Those, those are some of the key ones that I feel um, I've, I've certainly come across in terms of the benefits of, of using technology. There's also barriers and challenges um, and you know, we have to be honest that not everybody's going to want to use technology. I mean, I, I think there's maybe a handful of people at Redford Court that, that currently use technology. And we need to, to be aware of that, that it's not for everyone. Um, but I think what we do need to do is make sure that it benefits the individual. Um, and if we can try and 
focus on that, then we can really try and reduce the, those, those barriers as much as possible because you know, you do have practical issues, you do have issues with Wi-Fi that can really be detrimental to the, to the use of that technology. You can have cognitive impairments, so somebody's not able to understand how the technology works. Um, and even with repetitive explaining of that technology, they still struggle with it. So the first case example is of a 56-year-old uh, female who had an acquired brain injury following the removal of a, a, a cyst on her brain. And this left her with uh, memory difficulties, uh, primarily, and uh, executive functioning difficulties, so initiating activity. And this meant that we would have to physically have to prompt her to do sort of new and more novel uh, activities. So we, we trialled different strategies, and the first of those was the traditional uh, methods, which is you know, having uh, the planner up on the wall, having the whiteboard, having the diary to aid with their memory. And I think that's the correct thing to do, you know, to start with the basics, um, because there's no need to have to give somebody loads of fancy technology if, if you know, a planner on the wall or a whiteboard works for them. Unfortunately, that didn't work because she, because of her, her difficulty, she wasn't able to initiate looking at that information. So even though it'd be clear on her wall, you know, she would have different sessions on that day she wouldn't actually go and look at that information, which would mean that we would have to go and remind her. So we thought, okay, we'll put some prompts on our mobile phone so that it would send that, that reminder, okay, you need to write your shopping list or you need to, you've got this session at two o'clock or whatever. The problem with that was that she, if she didn't have her phone with her, then she would miss that prompt. And so it wasn't consistent enough. We then thought about a wearable device that she could, we could send the prompts to the, the watch and it would send her a vibration through her watch. However, unfortunately with that was that the vibration was just very sort of uh, subtle and it didn't, she often would miss that prompt. So again, that, that unfortunately didn't work. So ultimately what we came to, to, to use was the voice recording device, which is called the Memex. And this again is a memory, uh, is a, a wearable device that she could record or we could support her to record certain messages so it could be like to write your shopping list um, to phone your daughter or to meet the OT at such and such a time and it could be set for a particular time of day or, or time of the week and ultimately that was really useful for her because it, it was wearable and it was quite an explicit alarm and prompt for her to be able to carry out that activity. So the outcomes of, of that case were that it increased our independence and reduced the need for prompts. So instead of us having to go to her 10 times a day to say, you know, have you done this? Have you done that? Um, which would often lead to her to getting quite upset and emotional. She could record the message as to how she wanted it to sound. It was her own voice. So it was quite nice in that it was herself, you know, um, reminding herself effectively. So it was taking that sort of control. And also it was transferable to community living because ultimately what we were able to do was to trial the device while she was in one of our transitional flats and be able to show that it did work um, and so that when she came to being discharged back to her home the, the social worker and the funders were able to say okay well this has worked and they were able to, able to get funding and, and provide the vi device for her when she returned home which was really successful. So the second case example again as I said is very different um, it involves a 31-year-old male who had his brain injury following, I think it was when he was a teenager, on his, he was walking home and he fell and he sustained quite a significant brain injury. And this left him with significant um, physical impairment, so limited movement in all his, all his limbs, severe uh, expressive dysphagia and you know, quite severe fatigue as well, which limited what he was able to do. Having said that, having said that, you know, he's really cognitively, um, really physically impaired. Cognitively, he's incredibly, you know, with it. He's incredibly, he's, you know, he's incredibly motivated. He's got so many interests and, you know, such a character. And I've just put up there some of his interests. And, you know, his parents and, and ourselves will support him to go to, you know, uh, the Formula One Grand Prix and to, you know, download festival every, every week, year. What happens on a day-to-day -day basis? What happens when you know, his family aren't there and we, he's not going to these events? How can he interact with these interests without our support? Can we try and increase his independence with those? So the process that we had to follow in order to, to try and get technology for him was to find out who could help. And within the North West, there was a couple of organisations out there that we could, could um, find to, to help us. 
Northwest Assistive Technology who deal with sort of environmental controls and, and the more cognitive uh, equipment side and they're based at Entry Hospital. And then the ACE Centre who deal with um, more communication focused devices and they are a charity who get NHS funding. So having contacted them we then had to go through the referral process which I know you, you probably all know is quite can be quite time consuming. You have to provide an awful lot of information. Having done that we were successful and we then had the assessment process which involved ourselves, my, myself and Amy, um, and the occupational therapist and the speech and language therapist and the engineers from these organisations would come out and, and you know, meet with the service user and you know, trial different pieces of, of uh, equipment to see what was best, be able to see how they can maybe adapt it to meet that person, meet his needs. Um, and then ultimately we were then delivered with, with the technology which involves um, an environmental control called the Possum New Freeway which he interacts which enables him to to switch on the, the television to be able to put on his lamp to be able to put on his fan if he's too warm and he interacts with that using a, a knee switch. He's also got the AEC device which is called the Grid Pad 3 and he uses I've got a couple of pictures up there just to show you he uses it with a thumb switch and he also has a bespoke stylus, so if there's any sort of particular uh, programs on the, the, the tablet, he can, he can tap the screen. So the outcomes from this case are that he's able to access the internet and social media. He's able to uh, communicate with friends and family. So he's able to go on YouTube and um, look up what, is, you know, what films are on and be able to watch the, the trailer to let his dad know what he wants to see that weekend. Or he's able to follow his friends on Facebook. Um, or his fav favourite you know, Formula One driver on um, Twitter. So he's able to do those things himself. The fatigue reduction. So now that if he is particularly fatigued and he wants to be able to say something and we're struggling with that, he can have set phrases, set, set words that he can just tap easily and, and you know, use a switch to communicate what he needs. And if he wants to maybe try and communicate something a bit more extensively, like because as I said, he's, he's, you know, he's quite a character and you know, his personality shines through in, in some ways, but expressively he finds it difficult. If he can then maybe write a paragraph or, or really put his humour into the message, then, then that's, that's, you know, it's, it's really important. Um, and the increased independence, so, you know, as I said, he can now control his environment. So if he wants to, after lunch, go and watch his favourite soap, which is Neighbours, he can put that on and not have to worry that anybody else is, has to come and do that for him, which, you know, the small things, but really important to, to him. How can the Connectability Hub benefit me? Well, at, you know, while, I was, while we were providing this, this equipment for him and, and for the other lady, um, I hadn't heard of it. it. It wasn't something I was aware of, the, the hub. But for me, I, and just thinking about how it could help me, I was thinking, well, it's got expert advice. So if you're unsure about something, so as we've heard today, the ability to take equipment away or to take your service user there to see what is the best option because ultimately when it comes to referring for equipment if you've got that evidence to show that it works then that's going to only only help you to to be able to get that um that equipment for that person and to be able to increase knowledge and share experiences so you know whether it's me sharing experiences that i've had or somebody else sharing their experiences that can only help to 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 for all of us really to, to try and increase and um, help the, the service users that we work with. You know, as a, a key message, I think the important, you know, a starting point is about learning what's out there. Um, and and that, that is the first stage. But I think the next stage is, is certainly for therapists, is to be able to identify, you know, what, what being aware that the client is at the center of it and being able to see, okay, well, what is the best option for that person and what meets their needs you know how, how can we um, make them more independent and maximize their potential and i think you know the hub can only sort of help us to, to try and do that so so thank you <laughs>